Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Play Gravity Circuit. In the last part, we went after Hash the Cypher Circuit and now it's time for once again one of my favorite Rebel Circuits in the game. Mind you, every character design in this game is just really good. Someone has overtaken our automated supply truck system. I'm sure this is the work of that speedy bit, one of the Rebel Circuits. If we don't do anything, we risk losing essential resources. And who knows, they might make more Virus Army soldiers with the goods. So go out there, and try rerouting those trucks. Good thing you're faster than any of us, because, well, I would hate to run after the trucks myself. Take on this mission? Very well! Prepare for transfer! Character design, though, is kind of an interesting topic we're going to be talking about in a moment, though, because it actually ties into the thing I've been holding off for a while now. So up to this point in the LP, I have talked about the fact that I was holding off on a specific topic until later. This is the stage I was holding it off for. And it's specifically how I found out about this game. I found out about this game because I saw a trailer on Twitter that was retweeted by, actually, a lot of people, if memory serves. But specifically, in my case, by this game's composer, as well as character designer, Dominic Ninmark. Although they're from Sweden, so it's probably like Dominic Ninmark, if I had to guess. They've actually done a several other games before this. Uh, for instance, they were the composer for Bot Vice, Strikey Sisters, Viviette, Blazing Chrome, which is a game by the Odalis uh, devs that's really good. It's a really good contra, like Mighty Goose, Chinso Club, and most recently, I believe, before this, uh, Vengeful Guardian Moonrider, which is a game I've actually briefly talked about on the channel before that I want to try and attempt at some point. The reason I've held off talking about them for this long, though, is because this stage more directly ties into how I discovered them, uh, the music they posted on YouTube. Namely, the Eurobeat remixes they did of a lot of old video game music. Uh, I think about half a decade ago at this point. Stuff like Big Blue, I think the Team Plasma theme, uh, I want to say Upper Point Stars in there. The most recent one of that is only from a few months back. Uh, it's Boomer Kalanga from Mega Man X1, which I also love. And uh, they're using their experience from making those to make this song really in that style. And it's one of my favorite songs in the game because of it. Uh, notably, they're also the composer for Mega Man X Corrupted, that Mega Man fan game that's been in development for... Looks at calendar, uh, I think over a calendar decade at this point. Maybe even closer to 15 years. It's been a while, but, uh, but I'll play that when it comes out. This stage, though, is very reminiscent in some notes from these train stages in Mega Man Zero 2. While we're on these cars, they aren't actually moving despite the parallax scrolling. They, they stay completely still. Uh, but you're gonna have these green skateboards you can jump onto. You're gonna need to jump on missiles as they go along the road. The road itself is a hazard. And on top of that, we even have warning signs that'll come here and again, which will then be followed up by a giant green electrified gate. Uh, and the achievement for this stage is actually to avoid those as you go through the stage. The warning for them is pretty good, and you, if you're too high or too low in the stage, you basically don't need to worry about them at all, but it can be a little sketchy at some points to get around, I will not lie. I guess just to uh, talk a little more about the game's development staff, though, the main developers behind this are Domesticated Ant Games, though there's a lot of other people that worked on it, uh, cross-publishing and localization, QA and all that. Uh, Dominic Niemark is two of the credits in them themselves, uh, but on cutscene and portrait art is Colin Hughes, who I think out of the main dev team is probably the most storied person. They've been working on stuff since the Amiga, uh, with stuff like Streaming Wings. They did a lot of things like Turbo Prop Racing and Force Challenge on the PS1. Their first, more relevant role, to me at least, is paper animation on Broken Sword of the Smoking Mirror from the PlayStation, which they then came back to be on sequence animation and arrangement for the remaster of that. Killzone 2 and Grand Theft Auto 4, they're credited as Sony Computer Entertainment, technical support type roles. Uh, Killzone 3, same thing, Crisis 2, they're in the special thanks. Outside of this game, their more recent roles are actually probably their more prominent ones, because uh, they were on the Sony support side for Deathloop, uh, they were in the special thanks for Control Ultimate Edition, uh, Alan Wake 2, they're in special thanks, they obviously did cutscene and portrait for this game. But for Cyberpunk 2077, both base release on PC and Phantom Liberty, they were a senior principal engineer. Uh, in general, so they actually had a pretty high up role in working on that specific game. 
afterwards, and then in the main dev team for the contributor section was uh, the environmental pixel artists, which were Mae Livingston, Vampire Dev, Connie Nordland, and Damien Hutchins. Uh, Mae Livingston worked on this, Bonfire Peaks, and Making of Karateka. Connie Nordland on this, Chenso Club, Vampire the Masquerade, Blood Hunt, as a junior animator, uh, and Hay Fever, while Damien Hutchins, this is their only credited role. And while Vampire Dev is using their screen tag and thus doesn't have a Moby Games page for them, uh, you can find them on Twitter at VampireDev8. They are an incredibly skilled artist. Uh, their card in specific, you can see a lot of their traditional and pixel art stuff that they've done over the years. Apparently they've been doing this for over 10 years, and it is gorgeous stuff. Also, this is one of the only stages in the game that actually has proper mini-bosses in these helicopters that work a little bit like the B-copters from X1. Uh, they'll either fire their Gatling guns at you as they move, or they'll fire missiles at you, but as you can see, you can melt through their health pretty quickly, especially if you're good about using the grappling hook type, uh, burst techniques or enhancement chips. Also, that right there, I don't think I've talked about this in specific. Another reason why the hook onto an unstunned enemy to move over to them and immediately attack them enhancement chip is so good is because if that kills them, You'll, they'll basically automatically get grabbed if they're in midair. And that means you will have a projectile ready for whatever enemy is probably about three feet in front of you at that point. It is extraordinarily useful in most combat situations in this game. It's one of my favorites. Honestly, if this game ever gets a sequel, this one needs to make a return if it's not added to the moveset by default, because I think that'd be a really neat thing to do. We're probably coming up on what is the most frustrating part of the stage for me, though. We got a second missile rush, but now they start throwing a lot more missiles at you a lot more frequently. The timing on jumping over the missiles is a little tight. Uh, it's like the moment the uh, caution signs start moving back towards the edge of the screen, you need to jump then and there. Uh, jumping too early, you get knocked back. Jump too late, and you're getting hit and getting knocked back. So uh, watch out. And we actually fight this mini-boss twice, but this time we're over more hazards. Not that bad. As you can see, the, the best strategy for this is to use the grappling hook that drags you towards people and then do some upwards kicks to uh, do some quick damage. Going back to the key staff, though, uh, next up is the promotional artwork people. Uh, there are three listed, Jorge Velez, Tioft, and Damien Hutchins. Uh, the first of which worked on this, was in the special effects for Panzer Paladin, a game I also want to tackle at some point on the channel. Uh, was a cleanup artist for Indivisible, uh, and also did some work for Battletech in Roller Robot Derby. Uh, after that, Tioft is a Twitter artist, once again, uh, that's at T-E-O-F-T -E underscore. Uh, they are an illustrator and graphic designer. They do a lot of especially Yoji Shinkawa styled art pieces that look absolutely gorgeous. While Damien Hutchins is only credited in this game at the moment. We are coming up at the end of this stage though, and they start hiding some hostages in this stage in some pretty hard to see locations. Due to the placements of the trucks, it's very easy to miss one directly above you, even with the fumes, quote unquote, being shot out of the lifts, the thrusters, so to speak. On top of that, uh, easily one of the hardest to reach pallet chips in the game. You need, effectively, the pallet chip I have on for some good chances on top of some very specific burst techniques to do this kind of stuff to get over here and then jump up here to get it. It's real rough to get. Uh, there are some techniques that probably get that a little bit more easily, uh, but for my preferred ones, that's my best setup for it, which is kind of scary in its own regard. If you know better ones, uh, dude, fire away in the comments. Those were some cool stunts you pulled there, Kai. Think you could trace your steps back if you catch my drift? You know I can't do that. Eh, I'm taking these trucks with me whether you like it or not. Unless, of course, you show me your moves. Listen, Bit, we don't have to do this. Nuh-uh, I ain't gonna throw away this opportunity to spar with you. My tires are already pumping. You better not disappoint me. In a very weird thing, Bit sort of combines elements of Harpuya's attack pattern from Mega Man Zero with Brandish from Mighty Number no. 9. Uh, he can pose and then slash a giant wave upwards, which he'll do a jump doing a second one along the way. Occasionally he'll do a third slash when he lands. Uh, he can jump and then dash, firing downwards whenever he's above you. 
Uh, he'll do a pose occasionally, which will then end in a dash attack that just directly goes at you, but he can also do that from above you. Whereas his burst technique is the thing that's directly comparable to Brandish, uh, he does multiple slashes that are telegraphed via the slashes on screen, sort of like Cat and Anna's assist trophy in Smash Brothers. Dodging that's just a matter of keeping yourself moving without jumping into it stupidly. Eh, those were some slick moves, yeah? Ah, oh, don't give me that look. It makes me feel uncool. Stage can get kind of chaotic if you're trying to find everything along the way as some of the hiding places for items is just off screen enough to be annoying. But barring the occasional surprise from either the electric fences or the missiles, it's not that bad. Good work out there. The supply trucks are back on their original routes. Now we don't have to worry about running after them on foot. Let me know when you're ready to tackle the next mission. Colonel, you probably have your own vehicles for that, you know, right? All right, so bits. Pallet chip's a little interesting. It's just an outright movement increase. You move twice as fast and slide, I think, twice as far, which can be really fun to move fast with, but it's just fast enough that it makes it kind of hard to control in my eyes. Uh, but if you're trying to do speed run type stuff, it's probably your best friend. Again, I prefer the this particular one. For enhancement chips from the nurse this time around, I'm picking up the nullifying layer, which reduces damage you take from non-hazard type instances, so enemy damage and boss damage, effectively. I get the repair enhancer, which reduces the cost of repair stations within the stages, so the checkpoints. And I think it also increases your health regen from pickups. And I also get the grip enhancer, which is the one I talked about earlier in the LP. It makes it so that you no longer will slide down walls automatically. You can now manually descend, which, if you're trying to get certain things, it's not that bad. Ah, huh, you've been busy. I heard you confronted the shift circuit. Bit always was the competitive type, challenging others. Unfortunately for him, being as fast as he was, there really weren't many that could match his speeds. Perhaps because of this, he always urged others to try better. Almost as though he desired to have a rival to race with, no matter how unlikely that might have been. Oh, I think there's enough reminiscing about the past. Care to take a look at his burst techniques? Yes, we will. We get one of my favorites from Bit, the Gravity Dash, but also we get the screen interrupt. The Gravity Dash is effectively an air dash that allows you to send yourself in any direction at the cost of a burst point. A very useful for platforming, but it's also completely invincible and not bad for damage as well. The other one is a screen interrupt, which is effectively a screen nuke of sorts that just does low damage to a lot of enemies on screen. But the new NPC here is actually a bit of an interesting one that we have a bit of a minigame with them. Ah, Kai! It's so nice to meet you again, my friend. I don't know if you remember me, but... You, Bid, and I used to play some ball together every once in a while. Even if the other circuits chastised us for it. Stop slacking off, they say repeatedly. Trace in particular used to be on our case all the time, or maybe she was just teasing us. Who knows? She and Bit seem to be pretty close, after all. I wish things could be as simple as they were back then. Oh, did you want to play ball with me? Sure, here you go. Just don't break it, okay? It won't be easy getting a replacement while the virus army's still out there. And we actually get a ball we can mess around with, but we also have this hoop that's been here since we started the game. One of the achievements in the game is to get this ball in that hoop ten times in a row. It's also how you get kids' uh, companion disc, I believe. Best way to do it is grab with the grappling hook and then throw it from right about the left side of the box in the background, right about where I am right now, uh, and then throw it diagonally upwards. Uh, towards the right. It's a little tricky, but as long as you start figuring out the positioning for it, you'll get more and more consistent about it. Uh, this took me, I think, four minutes or so after that jump cut to get right. Not that bad, not that bad. Is it worth it just for that disc and achievement? Not really, but hey, if you're going for 100%, you're going for 100%, you know? Wow, that was so cool. Have you been practicing your aim? You need much a better shot nowadays. Or did you and Bit just let me win all the time? You must never know. But with that, I'm gonna need to end this off here. Thank you guys for watching, and in part seven, as usual, heading after our next Rebel Circuit. See you guys then.